It's a new year, so we're gonna we're gonna enter with a new message. We I titled today's message uh, "Start Here." So uh -huh. it's a new year. Start here. So we're gonna start here. We're gonna start with the gospel today. We're gonna talk about Jesus and how awesome He is. Because we know that we're entering into a new year. We're saying, hey, this is a, a new time. A lot of us make maybe you made some uh, cultural resolutions. I'm gonna lose so many pounds, or I'm gonna do this, or I'm gonna save a little bit of money here. I'm gonna whatever change that you decide to make. I actually started working out. Last couple days, I said I'm going to do a challenge: 100 push-ups and 100 sit-ups a day. So I've made two days, three days through it. So um, I'm going to, I'm doing that. I don't know if it was part of the New Year's or just me being tired of being tired. So I said, hey, why don't I start working out? But if we're going to talk about, hey, what is this New Year going to be established on? We need to know where to start, and I believe it starts with the gospel because that's the foundation of everything. It's the foundation of our beliefs, it's the foundation of our lives, it's the foundation of going forward, it's the foundation for freedom for us, and so uh, we've got to start with the gospel. So today we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 13, and I was talking last night a little bit um, with Brad, and, and we were talking about storytelling, and I, I hope to one day um, do a message and, and do it all in story. That would be really, really fun. But I'm not there yet. But Jesus was an excellent storyteller. He would tell stories. He would call, and they called them parables. He would have a story or a lesson, and he would um, bring out a truth in it. And so sometimes we get really, you know, try to get really scholarly, and we try to dig through these parables and say, you know, what every single word meant. But really, usually the parables, when he would speak uh, these parables and speak in these stories, there was one main point that he was trying to get across the people. And so he'd tell the story, and there'd be a big point, there'd be a big billboard, and it'd be like, this is what it is. And so I pray this morning, I'm about, to, I'm about to pray, I pray that the Holy Spirit would reveal to us this main point. Because right. I think there's just yes. one point for us to talk about this morning when we talk about starting a new year, when we talk about uh, starting uh, something new in our <laughs> lives. So let's, read, uh, let's pray this morning before we read the word. Uh, Father, I thank you this morning. I thank you because I know that your Holy Spirit is here with us and that you have sent your Holy Spirit to speak truth into our hearts, to reveal who you are. And so, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work today. God, that our ears would be open, that our hearts would be ready to receive what you have to say. God, that this year truly would be different. God, it begs us to start on a different foundation, to start on a true foundation, to start on a foundation that will not shake, that will not crumble, that will never change. So, Father, this morning we pray that you would receive uh, all the glory that you deserve, and, Father, that we would receive your words of truth. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're in uh, Matthew, we're in Matthew chapter 13, and we're going to start in verse uh, 44. Reading the Bible to us. That's what that was. Put the wrong button. The Word of God is speaking. All right. Um, so, Matthew chapter 13, uh, starting in verse 44. And these are again parables of Jesus, and he's talking here about the kingdom. And it says this in verse 44 The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Then Jesus, again, he tells a, a parable, he words it just a little bit differently, but he again emphasizes this point. He says in verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine <coughs> pearls. When he found it, and he found one of great value, he went away, he sold everything that he had, and he bought that one pearl. I don't know if you, what would be uh, treasures that you hold dearly to you. Um, sometimes I like watching different shows on National Geographic or show, uh, different channels of that nature, and they've got the treasure hunters, right? So they have the, the big map of some sort, or yesterday, uh, we were watching a TV show. Uh, Rachel likes a show called uh, White Collar. And so they had a, a treasure map. They had a gentleman who had passed away and he had willed to his sons a treasure that he had. But they didn't know where it was. They just know that they, they had had a lump sum of money given to them. 
and they couldn't figure out, okay, what was, uh, what was this treasure, or where was the treasure to be found, this inheritance that they had. And so they looked, and they had two copies of the will, and then on the will, they had this little uh, um, compass on it. And so when they placed the two pieces of paper together, then they could hold it up to the light, and they saw a little clue. Then they went over to this next little place and did a little clue here, and then they went over here, and then they finally found out that the treasure was right inside the room where they had been reading the will, inside the living room. It was inside of a wall where the, the father had taken a picture of the two siblings, and he said that in the coded, the coded way, he said the treasure will be between you. And he had took a picture when they were like five years old, and, uh, and it was perfectly split in two, and so it was on either side of the wall, and it was really really neat moment. I love going on treasure hunts, trying to find, you're going, I love going to the, the, the uh, flea markets and trying to find like, okay, what's going to be worth value? Or when, when we were growing up in mom and dad's house, uh, there was um, an antique road show that they would have on TV. I loved watching those things and, well, finding, oh, this is worth a lot of money. So I'd go around the house and try to see, you know, what can we have? It might be worth something or, you know, and, uh, and I don't know, that, that was a, a pursuit that I had, I loved it, I still to this day, you know, every once in a while I'll find something and I'm like, oh, this is rare, this is real, oh, let me see what this value would be, uh, collecting cards or all sorts of things like that. But we see here this uh, treasure that they're going after is related to in this parable is the kingdom of God. Said, the kingdom of God is like a treasure. Like something that is valuable. And when somebody found it, he said, you know what, I'm willing to sell all that I have in order to get that treasure. So this kingdom of heaven, or different ways we say it, we say kingdom of heaven, sometimes we say kingdom of God. Um, but we need to define a little bit, okay, what is this kingdom, what is this heaven, what is this that, that he's referring to? Maybe some of us have been in the church for a while, so when we when we hear the word kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God, we said, okay, I, I know what this is referring to, but I want to, again, we're starting, all right, it's a start point for Talent 17, so let's define here, what is this kingdom? And we can find as we search, what is the kingdom of God like, we, under, we begin to understand that the kingdom of God is not necessarily a place, like a physical place, but it's actually a rule or a reign. So the kingdom of God, it doesn't, it doesn't just have a physical place where we can go, we can go to the UK, the United Kingdom, right? And we can go and tour, and tour the land and see all the beautiful sights. But the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is, a, is more of a rule and a reign. So when we submit our lives there to Jesus, right, what does it take to enter the kingdom of heaven? It takes us to believe, to put fully our trust in Jesus as king over our lives. So we say... If I want to enter the kingdom of God, if I want to be in the kingdom of God, it requires first a, a lordship, a submitting to Jesus. And when we submit to Jesus, then we enter into the reign of Jesus. It's more of a realm rather than a place, a physical location. So we submit unto God and we enter into that kingdom. So it's not so much a place, a physical location, but it's a rule or a reign. His peace that comes over it, his love, his his forgiveness. We're going to see that further. Secondly, his reign or the kingdom of God specifically is talking about his redemption. Redemption, big word. It's specifically talking about the forgiveness that we receive from Jesus. See, we understand as believers or as those that are pursuing the truths of the Bible that we are a fallen people. We are ones that have a sin nature. We, have, we are ones that have committed sins against God. We have broken his laws and his commands. And that leaves us in a great debt. We talked about this a, a couple weeks ago. That this debt that we have when we're talking about forgiveness, this debt that we have is far beyond what any of us could pay. Uh, there's another story that Jesus talks about where a king had forgiven much debt. And it talked about uh, bags, bags of gold. Talk about a big amount, right? Thousands and thousands. And some people would say that the amount that Jesus talks about in that story was actually a numbering even in the millions of dollars that this gentleman had owed. But as the man came to him, that debt was forgiven. And again, I, I marvel at that because I mean, just like maybe some of us in this room, I think about my college debt. I think about the debt for my home that I owe in Missouri, and I say, that's a huge amount that God, that, that I owe somebody. And to have, 
to think about the transactions that I've had against God in my life, that He has forgiven those things. That is what it means to redeem. He has, he has wiped away everything that we have done against Him. He has redeemed us. He has made us whole. Just as if we had never sinned before. Just as if we had never committed these things. And so when we talk about the kingdom of God, we're talking about His redemption. The kingdom of God is being manifested in power when demons and unbelief or unrighteousness, ungodliness in our life is defeated. And salvation, <laughs> righteousness, Christ-likeness, peace, and joy begin to happen, begin to well up in our lives. Because again, remember the first point about the kingdom of God, it's not a physical place, it's the reign of Jesus in our life. It's a rule of Jesus in our life. And when we do that, then the things that we have done wrong, redemption, it takes place in our lives. So the kingdom of God is not a physical place. It's the rule of Jesus in our life. And secondly, it's redemption. It's, it's us submitting our lives to Jesus and receiving this forgiveness, being made very right. We also learn or know about the kingdom of God that the kingdom of God is present, but it's in part. So when we submit our lives to Jesus, we say, Jesus, you are king over our lives. He comes, he makes us whole, he redeems us, he forgives us of all sin, he, he puts us uh, in the same uh, place as him. It says that, that we are like him, we are co-heirs with Christ, but it's also in part. So we now, for, we now receive in the kingdom, we receive forgiveness, right? When we sin, we know that we can go confidently to Jesus and say, Father, forgive me. I receive your forgiveness. We can be made clean again. But we know that the righteousness of Christ has been uh, given to us. So when, when God looks at us, He doesn't see us in our sinful state. He doesn't see us in our weakness. But He sees us as Christ. He sees Christ in us. The, we know that we have received acceptance in the Father. That when we come, because of what Jesus has done, we've received acceptance. In part, we've received this acceptance. We, our, our condemnation, it says that when we are in Christ Jesus, when we are in this kingdom, that we have no condemnation. We have no um, bondage. We have no that, that feeling that, okay, I've done something wrong and I deserve this punishment and I'm, I'm wicked and I'm evil. We, we don't have a condemnation because it's been removed from us. We have fellowship with Jesus, right? We can now walk with Him and we can talk with Him when we have entrance into the throne, like Pastor was mentioning, that, that veil has been torn. We know that we have the gifts of the Spirit, that we are being transformed. But all of this is in, in part now. So we have this, all these things are starting. But we know the fullness of this kingdom. When will the fullness of the kingdom, when will all of these things be permanent? Be true no matter what it's permanent we know that we are waiting for the return of our king the kingdom of god is in part in part we come to jesus and we say hey i receive you you are my king you are my lord i receive the redemption in part we are are, are forgiven that we are made our lives are made right we are becoming more like jesus but there comes a day there will come a day when jesus returns for us and this is something that we all as followers of Jesus, we hope for, we long for, we look forward to the returning of our King, the return of Jesus, because we know when we are re when Jesus returns, that we will be united with Him forever. That it will remain. That there, instead of there being forgiveness for sin, there will be no sin. Amen. Wow. The, instead of receiving healing, praying, oh God, would you heal my body, would my body be made perfect? No, there will be no sickness. There will be no disease. We know that when he comes, there will be no more, no more injury, no more calamity, no more depression, no more spiritual warfare. The, the enemy at that point will be completely defeated. Yes. That there will be no enemy of our souls that would long and try to defeat us and bring us down and, and cause depression. It would tempt us. There will be no. It will be defeated. It will be finished yes. when Jesus comes. There will be no more ethnic strife or racism. There will be no more war. There will be no more death. This is the hope that we have. Yeah. This is what the kingdom is. This is what we get to take. We get to taste it now. Okay, we understand. We, we, we're forgiven. We get to understand His presence comes near to us. We, we understand that we've been accepted by the Father, that we're His children. But in that day, when Jesus returns, the, the hope of our salvation, it will be complete. It will be final. We will have it. 
This is the kingdom that they're talking about. All these things, they will come when the kingdom of God, when Jesus is established. So now, right, now in the kingdom, Jesus becomes our king. We can experience some of that goodness. But all oh, that's really good. But well, we know it's just a taste of what's to come. Could you imagine a place with no more fear? No more sin? No more temptation? Full of life? Full of health? That's what the kingdom is like. We learn also that the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God, there is a unity, both God and the Lamb. So right now, sometimes we have a picture in our mind, and we, oh, we can see, even from uh, biblical story, and biblical references, that in the kingdom there is uh, God the Father who sits on the throne, and Jesus the Son who sits at the right hand of the Father. But in the kingdom of God, these things combine together. So where, the, 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 in Revelation it says that, God who sits on the throne and the Lamb, the salvation belongs to them both. So that all of this is united in one and that we have salvation and we can experience it fully. So when we think about this, this treasure that the gentleman had found, the kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field. He sold everything to God. These are the things that the treasure represented, this forgiveness that's a treasure that we have. This healing, that's a treasure that we have. This love and acceptance, it's a treasure that belongs to the kingdom. It's a treasure that we have when we submit our lives fully to Jesus as king of our lives, of ruler, of leader. We say, oh, we can take experience. This is a treasure. This is a goodness because I can't find these good things anywhere else. A treasure, right? Like I said, treasure is something that is rare. It's not common. It's not common that we have acceptance, a full acceptance. It's not common that we have healing. It's not common to have complete forgiveness. It's not common. But in the kingdom of God, and underneath Jesus' rule, we have these things. Oh, yeah. Amen. It's valuable. So the kingdom of God, is a, it's a rule, it's a reign. It's not a physical place. The kingdom of God is about redemption. It's about receiving the things of heaven. The kingdom of God is about, uh, is, is present it's a hope for what is in the future completely coming. And the kingdom of God is that salvation, that Jesus being the lamb, the, the sacrifice for us, and God the Father the coming together and we experience them both together in unity. So if we're looking again here at the scripture that we started with, Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, they're one thing. And it's a good thing. And we read about it, it's a good thing. We want to So if we look at, again, Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, it says this again. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought this field. So what is the main lesson here that Jesus is getting across about the kingdom. What do we learn about the kingdom of heaven in Matthew chapter 13, 44? We learn one main thing. The kingdom of God is so valuable that losing everything on earth but getting the kingdom is a happy trade-off. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good trade-off. It's a good thing. I'll repeat that. The kingdom of heaven is so valuable that losing everything on earth but getting the kingdom is a happy trade-off. It's a good thing. Having the omnipotent, saving reign of Christ in our life is so valuable that if we lose everything in order to have it, we joyfully will sacrifice whatever it takes. I mean, that's the, that's the attitude in our hearts. That's the, that's the driving force behind us. And no matter what, if I get Jesus, if I get His reign, if I get His rule in my life, it's going to be good. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be like finding the richest treasure on this earth. It's going to be like discovering the greatest discovery in any PhD, any master's student. I mean, it's, it's like finding gold. Pure. Yes. That's what the kingdom is like. So the meaning and the value of the kingdom of heaven uh, is something that we have to 
debate, or we don't have to debate, we have to, we have to know inside of us, yes, this is the most valuable thing. Let's see, the kingdom of, the kingdom of heaven, let's look at this in verse 44, go through this a little bit, you know, slowly. I know it, it's just the one main point here, but we're going to look at this a little bit more, we're going to dig into this. All right, the kingdom of heaven is the true, full reign of Christ. Triumphing, being triumphant over everything in our hearts, this brings to us, right, everlasting joy, if we will treasure it above everything else. In other words, I think we can treat the kingdom of heaven, or kingdom of heaven here, almost like our salvation, almost like reconcili reconciliation with God through Christ. Right? It's just like our redemption. Man, when I know, when I begin to think about, when I begin to meditate on, Pastor was talking about this last night here, praying, when I get to meditate on, and even this morning, meditate on the, the fact that I have been forgiven, wow, man, the joy that flows in my heart because I understand <coughs> that I owed a great debt. And when I truly understand that, first off, that I am a so unlike God apart from Him, Man, the salvation, the, the redemption part, it brings joy. Oh, that I have received this great gift. God's rule in our life, He rules in order to save us and to bring us away from our own weaknesses and our own destruction into the enjoyment of Christ's rule. Let's keep reading. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is like a treasure hidden in a field. The focus here is not so much the hiddenness of the treasure. However, it's focused on the treasure itself. That there's a reward, there's something to be found. However, it does take some searching, it does take some seeking. Something that is out in the open, right? Something that is common, again, is not uh, valuable to us. If I were to say, hey, uh, let's go hunt for grass, it wouldn't be a great hunt. Because, okay, I, maybe in the winter time, with all of the frozen uh, water all over the place, maybe it's a little difficult to, uh, to find some grass at this moment. But we say, that's a common thing, Andrew, that's really not a thing to get excited about. I can't make a Facebook event and get, get a whole crowd of people to come search for grass. I think it's, a, you know, it would, but a treasure is something, hey, there's a little effort on my part to, Go after. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, God says that if we draw near to Him, if we seek after Him, that He will draw near to us. Right? It says, if we seek, then we will find. But there is an effort, there is a part in us to say, hey, I want to go after this. This is, this is valuable to me. This is a, worth something enough to me. But, hey, I want to go after it. I'm going to carve a little time out this week to pray with the church. Uh, I want to, hey, take that minute when I usually check my Facebook status. and I want to take that minute to pray and to seek after God because there is a treasure, there is a reward to going after that. There is something that we receive when we go after that. Yeah, so if, if, I say this if, but it is not, I know it's true, but if there is an all-wise God who is, is our joy to receive, then as we search for Him, everything that we're doing, everything that we're working for, is good. But somehow in our minds, we've put work in this category of labor and hardship, and maybe in this world there is a curse that comes under the, us that we would have to work and we have to toil, there's going to be the sweat of our brow in which we earn things, but work in, in this same sense is going after something that would receive the, the joy of receiving that good thing is greater than the, the work, yes. the effort that it takes. Yeah. Because if we learn something in Christ <laughs> and the kingdom that, that when we go after God, maybe it takes an initial work of, okay, change my schedule, okay, <coughs> carve out some time, okay, take this, but the reward is immediate. Yeah. So when we search after Him, we find Him immediately. It's not something we have to wait for. It's not something that we have to toil over. It's something that as we enter in, as soon as we, as um, Peter did take the step out of the boat, as soon as we step out, as soon as we make a leaning towards, remember God honors the humble, right, and resists the proud. As soon as we lean towards them, we begin to receive that kingdom, that joyous thing that we talk about. So it is a treasure. The focus is on that it is a treasure 
not so much on the fact that it is hidden. Because we know that any good thing, it takes a little effort. But when we put that effort in, we immediately receive His kingdom. Let's keep reading. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, this point. You know, we, could, we could examine here and try to push for details about what this man sold. What did he have that, that he could sell? Did he have a big mansion so it was a big cost to him? Was it, did he have a little shack and it was just really easy for him to say, hey, I'll, I'll sell this and I'll get this better deal? You know, we, don't, we, we can't press this too much for detail, but I would pose those questions to you, though. What is it that we have to sell? Some of us, we say, okay, it may cost me something to follow Jesus fully. There may be a real cost to say, you know, if I, if I pursue this kingdom, this rule of Jesus, it may cost me reputation, it may cost me uh, even re rejection, it may cost me uh, some family issues, it may cost me all sorts of different things. It may cost me, hey, I may have to change my career, or maybe change my focus, or maybe change the direction of my life. It may cost me those things. What is it that God is asking to cost that you are holding more valuable than the treasure of the kingdom of God? It's a question for the Holy Spirit to speak into your life. Am I pursuing something greater or trying to pursue something greater than the kingdom of God? Am I putting more value on something else, a better position, a better place, a better family, a better a situation, a better life, a better... Notice that word better. It is a comparison. But in Christ, in the kingdom, there is no comparison. There is no greater treasure than having the kingdom of God, having the rule of Jesus in our lives. So not pressing details of this parable, specifically of what this man had to trade off in order to receive the kingdom, but it does paint this picture that the main point is that there is nothing more valuable or has more worth than getting the kingdom of God. There's nothing more valuable than having Jesus as Lord of our lives. We can notice two things about this man. One, that he sold everything. He was willing to give up at any cost, whatever he had, whatever situation, no matter what. He had to give up everything. Secondly, that he did it in joy. Let's say, man, I guess I gotta make this decision to make Jesus Lord of my life. Uh, I guess I, I guess I gotta make the decision to sacrifice this for the kingdom. Uh, I guess I gotta make the decision to, to give in order for the mission of Catholic City Church and make disciples continue. I, I guess I have to do it. No, in his joy. And his excitement. And, Oh, I get to participate. I get to have Jesus as Lord of my life. No way! This is the best deal ever! Right. He goes, he sells everything. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get the kingdom. I'm going to get Jesus rule in my life because it's going to be the best thing ever. And he did it in his joy. Yeah. Come on. That challenges some of us, right? Yeah. It's a joy. Some of us don't know how joyous it is because we don't understand how great the rule of Jesus in our life. Some of that comes from misper misperceptions of who God is and what He's like in His character. And I pray that this year we'll begin to discover more of who He is so that who He is looks so great to us that no matter what, we'll sell everything and we'll follow That's after right. that. That's right. And I'm hoping that this year, man, we see Jesus in a whole new light. And, and just as we prayed and was prayed last night, that we encounter Him for who He truly is, not for what I, a pastor, or any other speaker says. That's right. Man, it becomes a joy when I come and gather with the family. It becomes a joy when I get to read the Word. It's not dry. It's not, oh, man, it's a treasure. Yeah. It's a treasure. <clears throat> the kingdom of God is so valuable that losing everything on earth but getting the kingdom is a happy trade-off. Push me forward. 
Apostle Paul expresses this very thing in Philippians. He, uh, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, it says this, Whatever I gain, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. I count it as rubbish. As my, uh, my, grand, uh, my grandpa used that word a lot, rubbish. <laughs> and growing up, it was, it, he was the only one that would, he only, uh, Grandpa Steve, he's the only one that said rubbish. And so we, uh, me and my siblings, we picked up on that a little bit. <coughs> rubbish, I mean, rubbish is, is worthless. It's like the scraps on the end. It's just like the trash. It's, it's like the bones we take out. I mean, rubbish not worth anything. That's what all of life, that's what all of our value, that's what all of, uh, all of that we built for, that's what all of it is in comparison. Yeah. Having Jesus as our Lord, as our King. Man. In the parable, the man sells everything he has so that he can have the kingdom. And in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, which we just read, Paul suffers the loss of all things that he may gain Christ. We, we've talked about this a few times, the suffering of Paul. Uh, I don't think any of us have suffered that for Christ. Beatings and enslavement and imprisonment. I mean, hunger, shipwreck. Also, this it's all worth it. It's all worth it because I got Jesus. Can we say this? Can we go into 2016? Can we start with that kind of mindset that it's worth it. It's worth it to serve Jesus. It's worth it. Whatever King Jesus you say to me, it's worth it. I can do it. I can go. I can submit to you. I can do it. The point here is not that we can buy the kingdom or barter for the kingdom or negotiate for the kingdom. Right? It's not. This isn't what it is. The kingdom of God is received without pay. It's uh, like a poor child, not a rich businessman. So this wasn't some transaction. He said, oh, okay, I'm going to sell all this and then I can buy all that. You know, it, it wasn't the focus on the transaction of buying the plot of land so that you can receive the, 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 the kingdom. It's more of a small child, a poor child. The Bible talks about this repeatedly in, in Matthew. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, it says this, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom like a child shall not enter it. A child enters everything with faith. A little child, I mean, they think the world of their parents, of the adults that are around them, and they, whatever they say, whatever they do, I mean, they want to go after it. If, if I say, except for Isaac isn't in the room, Isaac loves the Vikings, so I don't know what to do with that. We, we, all of the adults around him all love the Packers, but he's, he's set on his way of Viking thing. But, but for a child, they see what's going on, they see the adults around them, and they, man, I, man, whatever they're doing, I want to do it with them. And I see this at play in, in my siblings, I see even in the church, man, if dad's doing this, the little kids around them, they want to do this with them. Right? And if mom's doing this, they, they want to be our mamas, right? The, the child, they're just there, oh, they're excited about it. The kingdom of God will receive the kingdom of God just like a child would. We receive it not as a rich businessman, but as poor. And uh, I, I read wrong, the, the verse earlier was actually Mark. 10, 15, uh, the Matthew 5, 3 says, we receive it poorly. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For it's not somebody that has it all together that receives the kingdom. It's actually somebody that says, no, I don't have anything that receives the kingdom. <coughs> a lot of times this is difficult when I uh, was at Purdue University and I was sharing Jesus with uh, some of my uh, the Chinese that were they're at the university and they're studying and they really, um, they hear about Jesus and they would say, yes, Jesus sounds really amazing, his love for me, the forgiveness for me. And a lot of them would say, but I'm not qualified to be a follower of Jesus. And I didn't really understand that. I would try to explain to them what it means to be qualified in Jesus. The only qualification is that we come to him and we receive his forgiveness and we say, yeah, Jesus, you are my king, I follow you. And a lot of them, they would want to read 
the whole Bible. They said, I've got to read and study this whole Bible first before I can make a decision to follow Jesus. <clears throat> and, and I walked ahead and I encouraged him, okay, I, I see where you're at. I do understand you want to understand fully um, who Jesus is. I said, I would bring him back to Matthew 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This journey after Jesus is not saying I have it all together. I'm a wealthy businessman and I know how to make a transaction. This is a good transaction for me, so I want to make this transaction. I saved up my wealth, I can do this. The kingdom of heaven is like a poor person, a poor spirit, a child. that says, I'm willing to put my faith in him. And on this journey, just as a child, as a child grows to learn how to be an adult, and hopefully one day around 18 or maybe a little older, they get to, you get to send them out. Mom, Dad got to send me out. Maybe I, I came back, but we well, do send them out to be an adult, right? So the poor in spirit would say, you know what? I recognize I don't have it all in order. And that's why I need yeah. the kingdom of God. I don't have things in order. I am poor in spirit, and that's why I need a king like Jesus. And then as I walk with them, this is a child walks with parents, I begin to learn what it means to be a person of the kingdom, to be a servant of the king. And as I grow in understanding of what it means to live a life like him, that's not selfish and not for my own sin and not for my own ways, but it's for his kingdom. Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, Jesus was talking to his disciples about uh, this mission that they were going to have. And he says this, you have received without pain, give without pay. This kingdom that we have is not something that we paid for, but it's something that's been given to us and we receive. So we don't buy this treasure. We get it freely because we want it more than anything else. It's as if a poor child entered a toy store and the owner said, you can have the best and most expensive toy in this store if you want it more than anything else. Tell it to a child, man, they're going to be excited about the toys. <coughs> in other words, there is a condition for having the kingdom. For having the king on your side as your friend, but the, king, but the condition is not wealth, it's not power, it's not intelligence, it's not... Whatever we built for ourselves is not our own doing. The condition is that you prize the kingdom more than you prize anything else. Amen. That I hold the kingdom more valuable than anything else. That I'll seek after Jesus being the Lord in every area of my, of my life, no matter what. The point of selling everything in this parable is simply to show where your heart is. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6, 21. And if your heart is to have the kingdom above all things, then Luke 12, 32 comes true. Some may know that verse, may have it memorized. Luke 12, 32. If we value the kingdom over anything else in our life, if we prize it as the most valuable possession of ours, Luke 12, 32, yeah. it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's not hidden in such a way that he's trying to hide something good from us. You know, Sometimes around Christmas time, you, you hide the, the best candy, and you know, get the other candy for everybody else. It's not in that sort of way that God hides the kingdom from us. But he hides it on this condition. Are, are you, have you prized me? Have you prized my kingdom? Have you prized me being the ruler of your life? So much so, it is it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure to lavish my kingdom on you. My love, my forgiveness, my peace, my healing, my, my power, my everything that I have, it's all yours. It's his good pleasure to give us the kingdom. So to the point, Matthew 13, 44, is the kingdom of God so valuable that losing everything on earth but getting the kingdom is a happy trade-off? Can we say that this is true in our hearts? 
or to be more personal or personal or specific, we can lose everything with the joy if we gain Christ. That's right. We can't miss this word joy. It was, I think Jesus purposely put this in this parable, this word joy. In his joy, he goes and sells everything. The loss of all things is not sad if we gain Christ. That's right. If we gain Him, it's, it's a joyous occasion. Yeah. Oh, that we would make seeing Jesus and savoring Christ above all things yes. our goal in 2017. Mm -hmm. And how would that change? My interpersonal relationships? How would that change my family dynamics? How would that change my marriage? How would it change my interaction with those who are around me? And this year, Rachel and I have become parents, so I'm kind of excited to be able to eventually say, how will that change the interaction that I have with my kids? You know, how will this change these things if we pursue Him because we receive all of who He is? is that we would treasure Christ above all else. That's our challenge. Will we treasure Christ above all else? So what would this look like in our life, right? We're talking about this week, we're starting this, um, uh, starting 2017 with a time of prayer and fasting. <coughs> hey, carving out a little bit more time. Right. Put some effort, put some gun home. Good towards finding that treasure, try finding that Jesus. And it's going to take some of us, maybe, uh, we're going to set aside some time, maybe some of us, that we, we could examine ourselves and say, hey, you know what, I haven't been in a pursuit, I haven't been in a pursuit of this treasure of the kingdom, and maybe that needs to be a, a click in our, in our hearts. But also, I wanted to challenge us in this, I wanted to challenge us in feeling the burden. It's a joyful burden that, as the leaders of the church, we feel. If we love Christ as our highest treasure, and if we love people the way He did, ready to lay down His life even for His enemy, then we would labor to spread a passion for Christ to as many people as we can. We can, uh, if we stop just at this parable, then we don't really see the full picture. We, we see just the getting it for ourselves. And so getting it for ourselves is really good. And for those of us that have submitted to our lives as Jesus is king in our heart, then we can say, it's a good thing. The second part of this then becomes this burden. Where a treasure, usually in, in, in our typical lives, and even for myself, I'm saying, my treasure, I keep it for myself, right? And I, I get the treasure, and I'm like... I got it secure. I want to put it in a vault. Go get a lockbox down at the go go get a lockbox down at the bank. I want to put it away. Nobody's going to be able to touch the treasure. It's a good, valuable treasure. I want to keep for myself. However, in the kingdom, it's about finding the treasure and sharing the treasure. Yes. I love quoting. I don't remember Angel who you said you quoted this from, but it said, "I'm just one one baker telling another baker where I got bread." And I, I'm just I'm I now have a burden. We now have a burden. We have the treasure. Tell as many people as we can about this great treasure. How great and how wonderful it is to have Jesus as our King of our lives. So our, my prayer, my hope is not only that we would pursue the treasure this year in 2017, but that we would labor in it. You would join in the burden of laboring towards other people finding the treasure. Don't make it difficult for other people to find how great Jesus is. We should have a big billboard, neon signs pointing. This is the treasure. Find it right here. This is Jesus. You need him. He's awesome. He's great. Join us as the leaders of the church, Pastor and I, and other leaders. Join us in carrying the burden of letting other people know about this treasure. And 2017 isn't just going to be a year where we get to experience the kingdom of God and his rule. In our it's a year that other people can experience his treasure. And we get to help them find it. 
It gets exciting when I'm praying for my neighbor and then they start making steps towards finding Jesus and they come down and say, Andrew and Rachel, can we have tea on Sunday? And I said, yes, we can have tea with you. And she comes down and has tea and shares with us the, the reasons and the difficulties she's having following Jesus. And we can just share with them, hey, it's not this other hypocrite that, that showed you a bad picture of Jesus. We're pursuing Jesus and I'm imperfect just like that person's imperfect. But you know what? I know what the treasure's like. And it's really good. Amen. And we told our neighbor just three Sundays ago, if you get that treasure, so much better than what you experience with that other person. The treasure is worth going after. And then, and then we're going to live our whole life. It increases, it continues to increase our joy. Not only do we have the joy, but then we get to see the joy come to other people around us. And when we see the joy coming to the other people around us, then it even increases our joy even more. And we get to celebrate with it. Would you join us this year pursuing the treasure, but carrying the burden of other people finding the treasure? It's not enough for us to enjoy this great gift alone. If it was enough that we would enjoy the great treasure alone, we would have immediate, uh, immediately be in heaven upon our salvation. We would go straight to heaven, we could experience the no sin, no pain, no healing, uh, 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 healing, no sickness. Right? right? But it didn't decide it that way. He did, God decided that we would take part in other people finding the treasure yeah. as we wait for His full and complete reign. We say this a lot, but it, we commission you to go make disciples. Go tell other people. Go. Hey, if 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 you're not sure, we're gonna we're gonna do a couple series this year about how to do outreach, how to do evangelism, how to share this. But hey, if, if you're uncomfortable with hey having somebody over and having tea with them and and sharing Jesus in that kind of setting, man, it's, we're not against you inviting them here on Sunday morning. I hope that wasn't. It wasn't, um, wasn't like said anywhere. We're not, a, uh, we're not against people inviting them to, we had the Christmas Eve service, they had a whole bunch of guests here on Christmas Eve, and, and we had a whole bunch of guests on Thanksgiving. We're not, a, we're not against having guests on Sunday morning. That's right. <laughs> but we do want to encourage you and equip you so that you can have those appointments of, of tea and of dinner around your table at home. Yeah. We do want to equip you so that in the workplace and in your regular environment that you would have enough confidence in the things that you know about Jesus to share about Him. But hey, if you're not, if you're not there yet and, and, and you're at the place that you can say, you know what, I, I know where you can find treasure and I know the best place you can find treasure is, is come Sunday morning with me and, and there's a little, you can get a little glimpse of the treasure on Sunday morning. Hey, invite them here on Sunday morning. Invite them on Wednesday night to our missional communities. It, it, it's okay. We're going to help people find treasure in 2017. We're going to help people find Jesus as the Lord of their life. Don't keep it to yourself. But this hoarded joy rocks. But shared joy increases. It does. You can experience that with your children. You they get happy, you get happy. I can share something good with them and they get happy, and they get happy. That's our mission as a church. That we would find treasure, that we would share treasure. <laughs> Everything we do is part of the strategy. We're not, we're, not just doing, we're not just doing a prayer night last night for no reason. All part of the strategy. We're not just doing missional communities on Wednesday nights for no reason. We're not just having the kids downstairs for no reason. All part of the, the, the strategy that we're going to help find people find treasure, grow up in disciples of Jesus, and that other people will be able to find that treasure. I think about this, like, what would happen if we start seeing these biblical kingdom of God pictures happen. What would have happened if 3,000 people had added to our church in one day? 
Or what happens when we get so many youth in here that we have to start a youth ministry even though we have no youth pastor? Who is it that God's going to call and say, you know what, I'm going to help some youth find some treasure? Who is it going to help the, the nursery workers, help some, help some babies find treasure? Who is it going to be help the kids downstairs, you know, uh, find treasure? Who's going to help us, you know, with worship so that in the presence of God we can find His goodness and His treasure? Who is it that's going to uh, find and feed thousands? Who is it going to serve the widows and the community and the poor? Who, who is it going to help people find His treasures? So this morning, in closing, I want to again encourage you that trading everything for the kingdom is worth it. Yes. It's worth it. And it's God's good pleasure to give you His kingdom. His love, His peace, His joy, His healing, His redemption, His forgiveness. So you may find yourself in a couple different categories. One, you may find yourself in the search of the treasure. You're still on the pursuit of saying, hey, I don't, I'm not sure if the treasure is worth it. I'm still, I'm still pondering whether or not I should make Jesus the king of my life, the, the supreme ruler, the leader of my life. And for you this morning, I would encourage you, his rule and leadership in your life is greater than any pursuit that you have on this earth. I would encourage you that with all that, within, all that is within me, to get his rulership in your life. Get Sell everything to some of you in the room that are, are contemplating what I should, how much I should give up for Jesus. I encourage that group, sell everything. Get the treasure. Make 2017 about pursuing the treasure, pursuing the kingdom with everything that's within you. So with that this morning, let's pray. Let's ask the Holy Spirit that he would speak to us. And some of us in this room need to make the decision, am I going to pursue Jesus as a king? Do I need to make Jesus king of my heart, king of my life? Secondly, some of you say, hey, what can I do to pursue him more? Let's pray this morning. Holy Spirit, I thank you that we have an opportunity January 1st, 2017, to start. 